Today we'll continue talking about the nine da because we weren't able to finish them yesterday. Yesterday we were <coughs> able to speak about the first three da. Together these three make up a group which con is concerned with the characteristics of natural things. These are the three fundamental characteristics of natural things. And then next we have another group of three which we'll talk about today which are concerned <coughs> with the normalcy or the naturality of things. The next <coughs> da is called tamatitata, tamatitata, which means basically to to be set in normalcy, or to be to just to be established in in normalcy, which means that things just happen and go along and proceed according to the normal, natural way of things. And that normalcy or the natural way of things is nothing other than the first three da, anicca da, tukka da, and anatta da. The important thing, <coughs> tamma tita da, Tita means to be set in, established in, or to be standing in. And Tama means that which is normal and natural. Tama, the important thing here, then, is to see that this is completely normal and natural. When we say seeing it, that doesn't mean just studying it, hearing about it, or thinking about it, but to truly experience that this is how things normally are, to directly realize and experience that this is the natural way of things. If we speak in general terms, we use the word sankara, which means compounded things things which have been put together, formed. And all compounded things exist like that. When we say they exist like that, we mean they're, that's just how they normally are, impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. If we look inside, at this body and mind, or in, if we speak in more detail at the five khandas, then we see that all of this just exists normally in, in this way. This is how things normally are, May, namely the three characteristics which we mentioned yesterday. And if we look outside at all our property, wealth, friends, relatives, and all the various things in, that have a place in our lives, all the things that we call mine, all of these, without any exception, are just have this, this normalcy, the normalcy that we're talking about here. So, whether the things inside that we call ourselves or the things around us that we call ours, all of these things, whether me or mine, are standing in this, this normalcy. Previously, we never saw things in this way. We saw things as being strange or special. 
and we always wanted them to be better, higher, more beautiful, more wonderful, more delicious, more satisfying. And so we had all kinds of desires and cravings towards things. All of this is the product of, of ignorance, not understanding that things are just, not understanding the normal way of things, the naturalness of things. So that's the fourth da, or we prefer actually to call them the, the vipassana, the vipassana. Vipassana means to see clearly or means insight into the true nature of things. And so this insight of normalcy into the normalcy of things is, is the fourth one. We call them, but for short, we call them da, da, da. Da in Pali means state of being, as we described yesterday. But in Thai, it means I, the I that sees. So it's a convenient word, which is short for insight or vipassana. The fifth da is tamaniyamata, tamaniyamata. Here the word niyama means law. And so Tama Niyamada is the law of nature or the law of normalcy. That all things are existing or <clears throat> within under the power of the law of nature. No matter how much detail we look into things, breaking up them analyzing them into tens or hundreds or thousands or millions, we'll see that everything without any exception exists under the law of nature. This means that we see that there is a law of nature which controls every aspect of our lives, which thoroughly permeates and dominates our life. We see this, this domination of the law of nature to the degree that we realize there's no way that we can go against this law, that it's impossible to disobey this law. And so one sees this law clearly and is thoroughly ready to live in line with the law of nature. If in Buddhism we would like to have a god or something that we call god, then we can take this fifth da, the law of nature, as being the Buddhist god. Most Buddhists, however, say that Buddhism has no god, that Buddhism is an atheistic religion. But still, Buddhism has this highest thing which is controlling and running our lives completely, this thing we call the law of nature. Now we come to the sixth da, which is this very law itself, which has the specific name Itapajayata, Itapajayata. If we look at it carefully, we'll see that e tapajayada is the, the body of the law or the essence of the law of nature. Its, its meaning is that because this is the condition, this exists, or because there isn't this condition, this doesn't exist. And it means that all things are the conditions for other things. There is this interconditioning between all things. This is essentially what is meant by the Tapa Jayata. The 
birth of things, the arising of things, happens according to the law of Itapajayata. And then the ending, the cessation of things, also proceeds according to the law of Itapajayata. And then between the arising and the seizing of things, there is constant change and transformation, which also happens according to the law of Itapajayata. For example, what's going on in ourselves, in our own bodies, there are all these various atoms, and each atom exists according to the law of Itapajayata. And then the atoms that gather together in various molecules which form cells, and each cell exists and carries on according to the law of Itapajayata. And the various cells form groups, and the groups come together in and form organs, and every organ also exists under the power of the law of Itapajayata. And then the whole, the whole mess together, all these organs and everything else together that we call the body, is completely existing according to the law of Itapajayata. All the, all the living things in this, this universe, all the living things that have a place in our lives, our friends, our relatives, all the people and animals we, we know about and care about, all of them proceed according to the law of Itapajayata. Without any exception, they all exist under the law of Itapajayata. Then all the inanimate things in this universe, the rocks, the benches, the sun, the moon, the stars, all of them exist under the law of Itapajayata. Whatever happens to them happens through the law of Itapajayata. All things in, that have a place in our lives, all the things in this universe, whether living or non-living, all of them are under the power of the law of Itapajayata. Or to make it most most short, we just say every atom, every atom exists and it happens under the law of Itapajayata. When we say that, we don't have to talk about any of the other things. However, when this law is applied in the life of living things, when we talk about this law in terms of sentient beings that are sensitive, have, have feelings, then we give it a different name. We call it Paticca Samupata. Paticca Samupata. Pada. 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 Paticca Samupata can be translated dependent origination. It explains how human experiences arise dependently on a series of mental processes or physical and mental processes. This Paticca Samupata was explained quite thoroughly by the Buddha. And in the original teachings of Buddhism, this is a very straightforward, direct, although quite detailed and subtle explanation of how, how suffering occurs and how suffering is quenched. And in the Buddha's teaching itself, this is exclusively an explanation that has to do with the present reality of our own lives. And it's 
it also exhibits the fact of anatta, the way the Buddha taught but teaches samupata or dependent origination, help to show quite clearly that all things, everything in our lives, are not self. But then later, this very exquisite teaching was was confused and it was complicated and taught in all kinds of different ways. Some of the people coming after the Buddha tried to explain a lot of other things with it. And so they started to use this thing about the teaching of dependent origination. They started to use it to talk about past and future lives, which was never the Buddha's intention. And then they, it got very complicated and very confused, so that now it's very difficult to understand what people are talking about. We often hear about dependent origination, but the explanation doesn't always, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. It's so, it's so confused. But what we can, to simplify this, this matter, we can notice that there are basically two teachings about dependent origination. There's the original teaching of the Buddha, which very clearly shows the fact of not-self, anatta, and which is specifically concerned with the reality of this present life. This is a Baticca Samupada that deals with ultimate truth, with the ultimate reality of things. Then there's the other version, the later version, which deals with selves, with egos, and is basically a more a, a teaching of morality. And so it, it teaches about selves and egos that are born and reborn and so, so on. And this is to teach morality to people. This second version is the Baticca Samupada Bata, that deals with relative truth. So to simplify the matter and to make the most, to get the most benefit from Baticca Samupata, we should see that there are two versions of it. The Buddha's version that deals with ultimate truth and the the moral, the morality version that deals with relative or conventional truth. Details on this subject have been, we've talked about in other places. For example, in December we gave a series of talks on this subject and you could get those tapes and listen to them. There's also been some books published. There's one small book which has been translated into English also under the title Paticca Samupata, Dependent Origination. If you'd like, you can get this book and read it in order to find, more, find out more about this subject. When we talk about Paticca Samupata, we're essentially talking about the, the law of nature, or tamaniyamata, but we're speaking in more detail. We're going more directly into the exact workings of the law of itapajayata, and then when talking about sentient beings, paticca, samupata, dependent origination. When we when we examine dependent origina origination, we can approach it in various ways. If we take a theoretical approach, we can go on and on forever, going into all these permutations and combinations and proliferations endlessly. Or we can take a philosophical approach, which also is endless, just full of all kinds of ideas and speculations. So it's best to take 
a practical approach. And the practical approach is just to ask, how can we regulate, how can we manage this, the flow of paticca samupata? This dependent origination is like a stream which makes up the, the, the flow of our lives. And in practical terms, the important question is how are we going to manage that? How are we going to control it? And the, the reply to that is very simple and basic, much simpler than if we got into the, all got lost in the theory of it. The practical reply is to, to regulate, to have mindfulness at the moment of contact, to be mindful, to use mindfulness to regulate the moment of contact. If you practice anapanasati completely and successfully, then you will have the mindfulness required for controlling the flow of paticca samupata. If this when you can do this, then there will not be any contact, any sense experience that will be suffering, that will be misery or tukha for you. So now we've discussed the second group, a second group of three things or three das, this, which the second group is made up of tamatitata. The natural, the normal natural way of things, and then tama niyamata, the natural and normal law of everything, and then i tapajayata, that law itself. So this completes the second group. The first group was <clears throat> about the characteristics of things. And then the second group is the, so it's the group of characteristics. And this second group is the group of normalcy, of naturalness. So that completes our second group. The seventh da, the first of the third group, <coughs> is the, the fact of sunyata, this, the second, the seventh da is called sunyata, voidness. This is something that must be seen regarding everything. It is very important to see that everything is, is void. All things, both phenomena and the noumenon, all things, whether conditioned or the unconditioned, are, are void are in the state of voidness. When we talk about sunyata, we need to be careful about the meaning here. Often this is translated with different words. The word voidness, the void, the voidness is most correct. Often if we use the word emptiness, this can be misunderstood. We use emptiness or other translations. When we say voidness, we don't mean nothingness or vacancy or emptiness. Things are, but they are void of self. Sunyata means merely or simply voidness, being void of I and mine, of self, of soul, of ego. Things are as they are, but they're void of any essence or substance that could be called an atta, a self or soul. An important phrase of the Buddhas which explains what is meant of by voidness is void of I or anything associated with I. 
void of self or anything associated with self. Sunya atenawa ataniyenawa means that in whatever it is, there's nothing in there that can be taken as I or as mine. There's nothing related that is a self or anything that has anything to do with self. We've been, we've mentioned many times that the atta, the self, the I, is just a concept arising from ignorance, from misunderstanding. When one sees this fact clearly, then one sees sunyata, the reality of avoidness. When we see that, that the concept of I, of ego, of self, is just an illusion concocted by the ignorant mind, then one understands sunyata. For example, when we mentioned yesterday that when you kick your car, then then you have realized the highest stoop, the most, the greatest stupidity about the self that you could ever achieve in your life. And once we have this feeling that there is a self, an atta, then there has to be things associated with the atta or ataniya. So once we conjure up the I, then we also get all kinds of mind. For example, once we think that we exist, then there must be our life or my body and so on. So because of the illusion of atta, we also create the illusion of ataniya, of mind, of things related to and belonging to the self. This body and this nervous system and the mind based on that body and nervous system, all the natural processes of life can happen without any need for a self, a soul, an I, an ego. Everything in life happens through natural mechanisms. There's no need for some I or soul to be running the show. This is something we've already discussed. The whole point of sunyata is to let us know that life just happens naturally, that there's no self or soul or ego in this body, and there isn't any of those things in this mind either. Many people want to have a self or a soul. They, it gives emotional comfort and security. But there is in the body, in the mind, or associated to the body or mind, we can't find anything that is truly a self, an ego, a soul, an I, or whatever, whatever word we might want to, to call it. It's just like with the child that opened the watch and saw the parts moving and jiggling and thought that the watch must be alive. The child thought this way because it didn't understand correctly according to reality. And so it, it made the foolish assumption that the watch was alive just because it was moving. It made the assumption that the watch has a self because it was moving. And so in the same way, because of our lack of understanding, we look at our lives and see the movement of body and mind and take that to be a self, that there must be a self that's beyond, behind all that movement. This is an understanding that comes from ignorance, from lacking a clear knowledge about truth. So we need to examine the matter more clearly and carefully, just like the child eventually did. One day the child realized that the watch wasn't alive, that it didn't have a self. 
or a soul. And we can do the same thing with our own lives to see that these lives are free of self and anything related to self. We need to look carefully like this until we understand correctly. One has to understand the watch just like a, a watch repairman. Don't understand the watch like the, <clears throat> the young child. Otherwise, you'll basically be an animist that sees spirits and powers and ghosts and everything. And that kind of understanding leads to, uh, leads to superstition. And people in the past, or our more primitive ancestors and relatives, have seen things in that way. They, people living in the forests, saw, saw spirits and souls in everything, in the rocks, in the trees, in the rivers. And so they had many superstitious practices and beliefs because of this belief that there was Atta, self, in everything. This is an understanding that we no longer need. It's one that we can, we can let go of. We're quite saddened by the fact that many of our Buddhists believe that there are these powers and spirits and selves all over the place. Many of these, these Buddhists have failed to, to examine the Buddha's teachings and end up believing in selves and souls and spirits. This is quite unfortunate because the Buddha's teaching was a higher development upon the previous understanding of humanity. Before the Buddha, everything was, selves were seen all over the place. But then the Buddha saw more deeply and gave a higher teaching a more cor a correct an understanding that was correct in place of the previously incorrect explanations that explained how all things are void of self of e of ego of soul it's a shame that many buddhists haven't realized this and cling to their superstitious practices don't forget the, the sentence which we've mentioned many times, the sentence that we have a self which is not self. We have a self that is not self. We have a self that is not a real self. What, what this sentence means is that we have this, this ignorant concept of a self. But that concept, that illusion, isn't really a self. We've created this idea that there is a self, but you can't find any real self in that idea or anywhere connected to that idea. We should know three words. There are the words, there's the word atta, self, and the word nirata, which is basically nothing, and then anatta in the middle. There's atta, nirata, and at anatta. Atta is the understanding or belief or whatever that there are selves all over, that there are real existing solid selves, and that these are often seen all over. Nirata is the belief or understanding that nothing exists. It's basically nihilism. Anatta is neither of these misunderstandings. Anatta is that there is a self. There are things, these things that we take to be selves, but in fact they're not real selves. Things exist, but these things are not selves. So this is neither the, the one foolishness that things are selves, selves really existing 
permanent lasting substances or the other misunderstanding that there's nothing, that nothing exists. So sunyata is trying, is, a, is to help us see this fact. If we understand sunyata, we won't have the misunderstanding of atta, nor will we go to the other extreme of nirata or nihilism. So don't translate the word sunyata as nothingness or emptiness. That will, that will end up being nirata. But sunyata is voidness, void of, void of that self or I or mine. That is meant by anatta. There are things, these things that we take to be selves, but they're not real selves. We can tell children that you are the you that isn't really you. I am an I that isn't really I. We, we keep, we may say this, but sometimes the children may not understand. They may think we're trying to trick them or lie to them. But still we have to keep trying to ex explain this to even the children. You are a you that isn't really you. I am an I that isn't really I. While still in the womb or immediately after birth, the, the, the child lives without any concept or illusion of I, of Atta, of self. But then, soon after that, there are various, when this, the sense organs are working well, then there is various experiences, and then there arises the, con eventually, there arises the concept, I experience, I feel, I am. And so, then the, this stupid idea happens and the the child gets started off on a life of, of misery. So all of us, without any exception, begin life with the ignorant with ignorance, with ignorance about the self. We all begin life with this mistaken belief in self. And then this because of the, the self, this illusion of self, there develops selfishness. And selfishness is the source of all our problems in this world. There's so much war and strife and crime and abuse and exploitation of each other, all because of selfishness. This selfishness can only exist because of the mistaken belief in self. But there's nothing we can do to help because this, this is how we all begin our lives with this illusion of self. But if we're going to clear up this mess of suffering, if we're going to be free of tukka, it's necessary to understand this, this idea about self and see what the actual reality is. For example, if a knife cuts, cuts this finger, the reality is just a sharp metal instrument slicing through skin and flesh, and then some blood flows. But because of the, it sends, when this happens though, it has a feeling towards the mind. And so because of ignorance, we take it to be the knife cut me. Re really, it's just the knife cutting a finger. But we all take it to be the knife cuts me. So this is how, an example of how the self is arising regarding our, our normal experiences. There are just ordinary experiences 
but they're misunderstood to be I and mine. Look into this matter carefully and then understand it well enough so the knife no longer cuts you. The knife, so it just cuts the finger. One can see quite easily that this self doesn't exist all the time. Self arises arises intermittently depending on experiences. Whenever there is an experience that's misunderstood, then self arises, and then it goes away, and then another experience in self arises again. One can thus see that the self doesn't really exist because it doesn't last, and it keeps coming in different ways, in different forms. If we see that atta is just a product of ignorance when we regard our experiences in, in a stupid way, then we see that the actual fact is one of anatta, not self. And so when the eye sees a form, then it becomes I see, ego sees, or the ear hears a sound and it becomes I hear. I hear this pleasant sound, this unpleasant sound. Or when an odor enters the nose, there's not just smelling, but it always ends up I smell. I, I smell something nice, I smell something unpleasant. Or when there's a flavor on the tongue, it becomes, I taste something delicious, or I taste something not delicious, or touches on the skin. It's not just, not just touches. It always ends up being, I feel something gentle, or I feel something nice, I feel something smooth or coarse. Even with the mind, when the mind performs its functions of thinking or recalling or remembering or whatever, it's always, I think, this is my thought, I think this, I think that, I remember this, I remember that. All of these ordinary processes end up becoming I, 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 I. And that just shows what, what an illusion the Atta is because there are thousands, millions of cells. The self is constant every time it arises. It's in a different shape, a different form. And so what kind of a self is that? These thousands or millions of selves that we've got is all just an illusion. It's doubly difficult to understand this matter of anatta or sunyata because first of all, all, ch all, all of us as, as children and then adults instinctually have a, a sense of self. There's a basic instinct of self. And so we very naturally feel that there's a self and then have our own ideas about the self. But then on top of that, <clears throat> there are all the various religions and psychologies and philosophies that teach there is a self. So on top of this basic instinctual feeling of a self, we add all these ideas and all the teachings of all these religions that there is a self, that there is a soul, an Atman or something. And so it's du doubly difficult to understand the truth of anatta. Before the Buddha's time, they were teaching all about the Atta or Atman in India. And so it's what everybody believed. And of course, we find the same thing happening today. And so it was necessary then that the Buddha 
or what the Buddha did was discover the fact of anatta and then try to explain this to others. For many people it was very difficult to understand, especially because they had been taught so much that there is a self, there is a soul, and so on. So it's very difficult for people to understand anatta. And this is still the case for many of us. And it's very difficult to explain, to express, and help people to understand the facts of anatta and sunyata. But there's nothing else to do, because if this isn't understood, there's no way that that tukka will be quenched. If anatta is not understood, then there's no way that suffering can be ended. So the, the Brahmanistic, the Vedic and Upanishadic teachings of Atta and Atman spread all over the world from India, spread to Sri Lanka, to Burma, even to Thailand. And so people in all these places re had this belief in Atta, in self or soul, for even before Buddhism appeared. And then after the Buddha appeared and taught Anatta, it was always a very, it was always a uphill battle, always a struggle to help people let go of the, the false belief in Atta. And so even when as Buddhism spread to other countries, to Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, China, and other countries, it always had to, has to struggle against the very firm attachment and belief in Atta. Nonetheless, we must admit that there is some benefit and value in the belief in Atta, in self. Because if one believes that one has a self, if one is sincere about this, then one, one wants to have a good self, a better self. And so this has a lot of value in terms of morality, that the belief in Atta can be used for people to have a better life and to be good. But no matter how moral one is or how good one acts, as long as there is a, an atta, a self, then it gets heavy, life becomes a burden, even if it's good. So in the end, the only way to be completely free of dukkha is to understand anatta. If we still believe in atta, no matter how moral and good we are, we will not quench suffering completely. Only by a thorough understanding of anatta does one completely eliminate tukkha. However, we can fit these two viewpoints together. They're not really at odds. The moralistic understanding of atta and the ultimate understanding of anatta and sunyata can be, can complement each other. So if we want to understand the whole story of human life and human development, we can start with one abandons evil. One abandons evil and does good. This is still the moral level, stopping all everything that is bad and sinful and becoming good, being good. But there's still atta in that being good. And so then one must abandon the atta and enter voidness. So from bad to good. But in being good, there's still suffering, there's still tukkha. And so to let go of the good in order to go beyond all bad and good, and then there is voidness, 
voidness which is completely free of I and mind. So the whole, the whole picture of human progress can start with the conventional, moralistic level, which is all caught up with ideas about self, about I, what's good for me. But then in the end, that must be let go of in, through an understanding, a realization of sunyata, voidness. So from bad to good, and then from good to voidness. And then after this seventh da, we come to the eighth da, which is called tata da, tata da, thusness or suchness. This eighth da is following from all the others. And the realization that this anatta, the fact of not self, the fact of voidness, it's just the way things are. Things are just like that. This is the suchness or the thusness of things, the ta da, which in short, the thusness or the, the way things are, just the simple way things are, their thusness or suchness is that there is this atta which is not a real atta. There's the appearance of atta which is not really atta. This is what we mean by tatata, the thusness of things. For the most complete and thorough understanding, we have to have seen all of these from the start to thoroughly penetrate anicchata and tukata, anatata, tamatitata, tamaniyamata, itapajayata, up through sunyata. When all seven of these have been thoroughly explored and penetrated, then one can see that's just how it is. That's the thusness, suchness of everything. And then one thoroughly understands so seeing that things are just like that, that this is how things, this is just the way things are. Things can't be otherwise, they're just like this. Which includes all the other das from anicchata to sunyata, sunyata. Seeing all of that is just being thus, that's just how things are we thoroughly understand the ta da When the ta da thusness is thoroughly penetrated and realized, then there's no way that any feelings of positive or negative can arise. Before seeing the ta da we have ideas of this is good, this is bad. This is satisfying, this is dissatisfying, this is exciting, this is boring. But when the ta da is penetrated and realized, then none of those, those kinds of feelings arise again. Things are just thus. There is this thusness. And there's, there's none of the confusion and delusion of excitement and boredom positive and negative. In seeing da ta da, there's one transcends, one goes beyond the, the limitations of all dualities. The mind is no longer trapped in dualistic thinking, dualistic labeling. So then all the pairs of opposites such as positive and negative good and bad, winning and losing, um, hot and cold, male and female, all of these, all of these dualities are let go of and the mind is above all these pairs of opposites, winning and losing, excitement and boredom, laughing and crying, sadness and gladness are all transcended 
by understanding thusness, tathata. Seeing tathata, thusness, there's none of these things have any meaning and power over the mind. All this positive and negative, good and bad, happy and sad, don't have any power over the mind. That means that none of these things can bite the mind. There's nothing that bites the mind that sees da ta da. So life no longer bites itself. There's life doesn't bite itself and nothing bites life when da ta da is realized. Then we can see easily how the eighth da leads into the ninth da, which is adamaya da. When the mind sees thusness, so that it's beyond all pairs of opposites, is no longer under the power of dualisms, of dualities, then that mind is beyond the ability of anything to concoct it. Nothing can cook up or stir up that mind. And so the eighth da leads to atamaya da, to unconcoctability. There's nothing that can stir up the mind at all in the least way. The mind with adamayata or the state of adamayata can be described as, as, as completely still. The mind is completely still because nothing can come and shake it or stir it up. It's a mind that is, can endure anything. It's, or we could say it's the mind that is invulnerable. It's a mind that has the highest immunity to the degree that it's completely invulnerable. The mind with Adamayada is in, invulnerable to anything. There's nothing <coughs> that has any power over it that can concoct it in any way. This is what the condition or state of Adamayada is like, one of total invulnerability. We can think back to the word, the phrase we mentioned yesterday, any, any woman who has Adamayada will be completely safe from the, the games and tricks of any man. So one won't be able to laugh, won't be able to cry, there won't be any sadness or any gladness because the mind is completely stable and still. Although it experiences all the different things, although the flow of experience continues, none of it can shake or rattle the mind. The mind is completely still and invulnerable because of Adamayada. And the most important meaning of Adamayada is that the mind is above the meanings, above all meanings of positive and negative within this universe. It's a mind which has been saved, a mind that is liberate, liberated from the power of things to, to concoct it. It's a mind that's been totally liberated from everything. So this is why we say that the mind that has a Dhammayata is as hard and strong as a diamond. And if there's, if one has a mind like a diamond, then, then one's life is like a diamond also. This means that it's a life that's so strong that nothing can cut it. A life like a diamond can't be cut by anything, but it can do all kinds of things. Nothing can be done to this life, but this life can do all kinds of things, just in the way that while nothing can cut a diamond, a diamond can cut everything else. This is what it's like to have 
a mind and a life like a diamond. The third group <coughs> is the group of sunyata, tathata, and atamayata. We call this group the group of liberation. With the first group of insights or das, we see the characteristics of all things. And then with the second group of das, we see the normalcy, the naturalness of all things. And then in the third group of das, one, one realizes that the mind's liberation from all things the mind, the being liberated from all concepts of Atta, this is the highest, the supreme liberation. We'd also like to tell you now, so that things are clear, that these nine Das, and organized in these three groups, we've done this we've arranged things in this way be, with the intention to make it as easy for you as possible to study the essence of Buddhism by using these nine das arranged in these three groups one has the we feel this is the best way to understand what Buddhism is really teaching this is our own arrangement in the Buddhist, the original scriptures, all nine of these dons appear quite, quite frequently, but they are, appear in different ways, often separately arranged in different places, in different styles. What we have done is gathered them together and arranged them in this way to make it as easy and simple and direct as possible to understand the, the heart of the Buddha's teachings. In the scriptures there are 84,000 Dhamma topics to, to learn about, which is quite a bit. And to save you the trouble of learning all 84,000, we've distilled out these nine Das in these three groups. If you can understand these nine das, then you will understand all of the 84,000 Dhamma topics. So focus your attention on these nine states of being, these nine das, and you will understand everything there is to know in Buddhism. If one penetrates all nine of these das, if they are all understood, then all problems and difficulties in life disappear. All tukka will be abandoned and destroyed. Then life is, is totally free and cool. You'll notice that we've stuck, we've emphasized and focused upon just these nine das. This is in order to save you time and energy in your study and practice of Dhamma. You've noticed, some of you may have noticed that we haven't spent time talking about moral teachings like metta, friendliness, garuna, compassion, mudita, ubeka. These, the, we haven't talked about these moral teachings because if one has these nine das, if one realizes sunyata, datata, and adhammayata, then one doesn't just have a moralistic level of love and friendliness and compassion, metta, garuna, mudita, ubeka, but there is the highest, the most perfect metta, garuna, mudita, and ubeka, these qualities of there is perfect friendliness, perfect compassion, perfect sympathetic joy, and perfect equanimity, because there's no self. If there's still a self, these are all just ways to control the self with morality. But if there's no self, 
<clears throat> then there's no selfishness. And com perfect selflessness, perfect unselfishness is the real meaning of metta, karuna, and so on. So we haven't spent, we haven't wasted time and energy on dealing with these moral morality things. We haven't talked about abandoning sex or abandoning sexuality and sexual pleasures. We've just focused on these nine das because if one thoroughly penetrates sunyata, if we realize a dhammayata, then sexual, sexual feelings, indulgence in sexual pleasures can't happen in the least. So to save time and energy, we focused on just the essence of Buddhism, these nine dhas. For example, if you have any problems with one defilement or another, for example, raka, sexual lust, the best way to deal with this problem is with the understanding of sunyata, adhammayata. If one doesn't use this, these methods and uses some of the things like contemplating corpses or, or, or contemplating the foulness of the body, these, these may not work so well. Because if one still has some feelings of self, if one is still clinging to self, then this lust may take another form and one may do some perverted sexual things with the corpse. So it's the best way, the most efficient, the quickest way to deal with these things is directly with sunyata, tathata, adhammayata. And so now with this understanding of adhammayata, the mind is able to withstand, has immunity against all problems. The mind can solve all, all problems and the mind can prevent all problems. This means the mind is like a diamond. There's no problem, there's no difficulty anywhere that can happen to the mind that understands Adhammayata. Let us stress once again the, the value and benefits of Adhammayata. With Adhammayata, the mind that sees, realizes Adhammayata becomes liberated from everything. It becomes the the mind that we say is the noble one, the Aryan mind that has raised itself above the world, above all worldly conditions, all the positives and negatives of this chaos and turmoil. The mind raises itself above that and is the Loguttara mind. Loguttara means above the world, beyond the world, liberated, freed from the world. Adhammayata has the benefit of liberating the mind from the world, so then the mind is above the world. And the mind that is above the world can't be touched, can't be harmed, can't be tormented by any of these worldly conditions like positive and negative, when winning and losing, getting, destroying, happiness, sadness, and on and on and on. So let us stress this highest benefit of a Dhammayada. It frees the mind from all worldly conditions so that mind can't be concocted by anything. There's no problem that can touch that mind. So study these Das continually. Keep studying them until there's, we have little Adhamaya Das. There's more and more Adhamaya Da until Adhamaya Da is complete. And that means being an Arahant, an Arahant, the perfected human being. 
we can take the diamond as being the thing with the highest value. And so these nine das, we can call, we can compare them to being nine diamonds. These nine insights have the value or have the strength and hardness of diamonds. And so we call them vachara tammas, vachara tammas, meaning dhammas or things that are like diamonds or have, are, have the value of diamonds. And when the mind has these nine vachara dhammas, it becomes a vachara jita, a diamond mind. And when there's this diamond mind, then life becomes a vachara chiwa, chiwita, or a, a diamond life. This is the, the highest life possible, the diamond life that of the diamond mind. This mode of living we can call vachara chiwi, life that is like a diamond, the diamond life, the diamond-like life, life that has the value and strength of a diamond. And henceforth, this this life won't bite itself. This life doesn't bite its owner. It doesn't bite itself. And there's nothing can bite it. This life is beyond, is free from all biting and all tukka. This is the diamond life that doesn't bite its owner. And so the life that doesn't bite its owner, the life that doesn't bite itself, is as we have been describing the last couple of days. And so now we've finished our discussion of the life that doesn't bite its owner. And we've also used up all the time we have for today. So this ends today's mm -hmm. lecture. So thanks for being very patient. Listeners, if you've got the strength and endurance to listen to another talk, come back again tomorrow morning. That's all for today.